Okay, good afternoon um, to all the participants. I saw just, just a minute ago that we already have uh, some 50 people who logged in in time. The, others one, uh, the other ones I think will come a little bit later. Um, we had 300 people registered. I suppose about 200 might, might show up in the end, we'll, we'll see. Um, my name is Willy de Bakker. I used to work for the uh, uh, ETY as the head of communications. Now I'm uh, retired, fortunately, and I have lots of time to do other things. And uh, that's why I'm moderating today one of the uh, very interesting uh, panels or webinars that uh, ETY regularly uh, provides uh, on, on the internet for the moment. The, the topic of today is the future of democracy in times of planetary crises, not one crisis, but crises. And I think there's no debating about what that means. Everybody is well aware of what happened in the last few years and well aware also of the uh, climate emergency that we are facing. So, but why are we talking about the future of democracy? But before I come to that and give you some context, maybe I'll just uh, also provide you with some practical information. Um, if you have any questions for the participants, for the panelists, please uh, use the Q&A. You will see there's a Q&A button that you can use where you can uh, post your uh, questions. Um, those questions can also be upvoted. That means that there is a possibility um, that you actually put it higher on the list. So you prioritize if you support a particular uh, question. Um, if you want to tweet about what you are hearing, please do. We recommend that, by the way. And we have created a special hashtag called hashtag future of democracy or reinventing democracy. But I would, I would say let's just use future of democracy and use please also the Twitter handle of the ETY, which is at ETY underscore dot org at ETY underscore dot org. The webinar today fits within the work of the uh, think tank, the ETY think tank, on the social ecological transition and its challenges. It's also one of the priorities for the European trade unions as such. And therefore, we um, have also today uh, our commentator who works for the ETUC and who I will introduce a bit later. But for now, he's with me now in the studio. For now, also, let me say that we have two fantastic um, and, uh, uh, speakers, keynote speakers. I'm very happy to have both of them because they have written some very, and one interesting book, each of them, um, which I've read and which I think is really putting all the questions on the table that we are going to try to put, to bring here together today. Now, um, a little bit of, uh, information on the structure of the debate. We'll have 10 minute introductions from the keynote speakers. After that, I will ask them each a few extra follow-up questions um, and uh, they can also respond to each other. Then we'll have a reaction from uh, Ludovic who is our trade union representative here. Um, and then we'll have, um, of course, also the responses to the reaction of Ludovic by the two keynote speakers, but then we should have at least around one hour to discuss with the audience. Um, and hopefully there will be lots of questions within the Q&A so that we can pick up on your questions and confront them, uh, confront our two speakers with your very interesting questions. So why a debate on democracy? Is there really a crisis of our representative model of democracy? Well. If you look at the different trends, I've just highlight, want to highlight a few more as a, as a kind of a wake up, uh, wake up um, call, I would say, or just a few things which I wanted to, to indicate as trends. There is, of course, always, and there have been very many surveys recently, last years, last 10 years at least, which explain that there is low trust in politics. Um, the second point is that there seems to be a delivery problem. If we look at the COVID crisis, if we look at the uh, climate emergency, the governments and the 
the uh, economic leaders do not really seem to either understand that we're in an emergency and with the COVID crisis for sure in the beginning there was a lot of experimenting but experimenting that didn't always work well in some countries even the situation with the COVID crisis is still very bad there is still of course the issues of the vaccines which are not uh, globally divided equally etc cetera, etc cetera. so there seems to be a politics uh, problem of delivery there is no serious delivery of what needs to be delivered and therefore you have a lot of anti-politics um, you have of course populism in different countries um, do i name do i need to know, name people like trump bolsonaro in brazil the illiberal illiberal democracies in eastern europe etc etc one of the things which uh, next to the delivery problem seems to be a big other issue is the short-term horizons of our policymakers and economic decision makers. Economic decision makers seem to be looking not much further than the next financial report uh, and uh, political decision makers seem to be always looking for the next elections and therefore there is a bit of a short-term uh, uh, horizon and, and certainly what I would call a democratic myopia. If we look at those things, um, I think la last but not least, there is also something that a lot of people have uh, pointed to, which is the power of the financial sector and the power of the, uh, the lobbies, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the issues I think which we, we can see as a part of the um, crisis of democracy. But of course, there's also lots of resistance um, you see the yellow vests, you saw the Friday for the Future uh, demonstrations. There have been lots of court cases against the failing climate policies in different countries, uh, successful court cases, by the way. And there is a big debate going on at international level uh, on the introduction of the notion of ecocide in the international justice system. All signs that not only do we have problems, we have also lots of people who have new ideas and are exper experimenting with more citizens' participation to, to improve democracy or to even radically reimagine or reinvent it. And the two keynote speakers that we have here today with us uh, belong in this last category of, I would say, people who come up with new solutions on how to rethink our democracy. What is the importance and the relevance for the trade unions of this debate? Well, democracy as such has always been an important part of the work of trade unions. And of course, very much in the focus in the, of the trade unions has always been the democracy at the workplace. As social partners, it's very important for them to have a say in the decisions which uh, are really uh, very important for workers on the workplace itself. Um, and the question there that I probably will ask uh, Ludovic to answer later on is do these new initiatives of um, attracting the citizens more into the decision making, do the trade unions fear this? Uh, is it possible that citizens could uh, uh, start deciding on issues or certainly having a voice on the issues that now fall under the remit of the social partners, or do they embrace all these new experiments? But we'll come to, uh, to Ludovic on that, on that question later. Um, now, without further ado, let me introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, our key first keynote speaker uh, is Helene Landemore. Helene is French, but works in the uh, US. At Yale University, she is Associate Professor of Political Science there. She's written a book, which I have here with me and which I would certainly recommend to anybody, to everybody. It's a bit um, um, uh, provocative sometimes, but that's, I think, her French background, which is really good that she dares to think a little bit further than some other people. And the, um, the, the subtitle of the book, Open Democracy, is reinventing popular rule for the 21st century. And therefore, let me start my first question and to give you the floor for your first intervention, um, uh, Hélène. What do you understand as open democracy? 
Does it mean we have a closed democracy now? And what are the principles behind the, uh, the open democracy? You have 10 minutes to, uh, to intervene here. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. So thank you, Willy Debacker, for, for inviting me to present to this uh, rather unusual audience for me. So in order to answer your question about what I mean by open democracy and whether our current democracies, democracies are closed, I, I want to go back a little in history uh, to, the, to the origin of our, of our systems, and, uh, and which explains to me why they are indeed closed and in fact barely democratic on some definition of democracy, right? So our representative, our so-called representative democracies um, originate in what historians call representative governments. Governments where the law is made by periodically elected legislatures. So we started to call these governments democracies um, around 1830 in the US and France and around 1870 in Great Britain. But the reality is that they were designed as an alternative to democracy, which was associated with mob rule as much as they were designed as an alternative to pre-existing monarchies and sort of the uh, ancien regime types of order. So if you take Madison, for example, in the Federalist Papers, what does he say? He said that the American Republic um, is and should be characterized by the total exclusion of the people in its collective capacity from any share in government. So that's why in the US to date, actually, you don't have the possibility of a referendum, for example, uh, at the federal level. So our systems are built after Republican principles of popular sovereignty, common good, and popular consent. But ultimately, they were meant to be elected aristocracies of sorts, with the best and most virtuous at the helm, refining and enlarging the popular judgment. So you have all these desirable things, like the liberal aspects, the emphasis on individual rights, as Trump's against uh, government which justified created all sorts of counter majoritarian devices and institutions from bicameralism to judicial review, etc. But the fact is that in terms of who's ruling, it's not really the people, it's a category of, of, uh, of people selected by a, um, a, a selection mechanism we, we call elections, right, which itself doesn't distribute power equally. So it's actually something that, you know, Aristotle told us a long time ago that uh, Montesquieu, Rousseau, others have repeated after them, elections are an oligarchic mechanism of distribution of power. So you, you cannot be surprised at the end if those who rule end up being forming a relatively uh, homogeneous socioeconomic category of people who stay in power uh, you know, for long periods of time, because if, even if there is periodic elections and sort of uh, rotation through that uh, periodic uh, renew renewal, you, you don't really bring in fresh voices and new and uh, people who don't generally don't have access to power because those people cannot access power through that kind of oligarchic mechanism. And it's not, I wanna emphasize this, because often people criticize elections for the role of money in politics and you know, things like that, like the fact that uh, you know, the, the last uh, uh, elections in the US cost around uh, $14 billion. I mean, it's not just about that. It's not contingent on a particular economic or you know, political context. It is intrinsic to the selection mechanism itself. Something that Bernard Manin, who's a um, you know, very um, important uh, political theorist with a book uh, called uh, The Principles of Representative Government said also a long time ago, um, elections are based on a principle of distinction. Human choice will go always to things like wealth, charisma, height, uh, you know, and so you won't, you will by default exclude a number of voices from, from the center of power. Yet, because the franchise was expanded in the 19th century to non property adult males and later blacks and women, we have convinced ourselves that with this history, we have a democracy. And I think it blinds us to the conceptual possibility that we are not in authentic democracies and that we need to fundamentally rethink what that means and what they would take and the kind of institutions we would need to have that kind of uh, authentic democratic power. Um, and why is it bad to not have actual, you know, people's power, you might ask, right? I mean, after all, the system is pretty functional, you know, compared to authoritarian regimes or, or um, you know, uh, countries where they don't have elections, perhaps. Although, again, you know, Singapore would be, um, uh, you know, where there's no real competition would be a counterexample. Well, the argument for why you should have democracy, I think, goes back to something that I've argued in my previous books, um, the argument from collective wisdom, among others, that if you don't include everyone, you lose out on voices that matter, 
for um, the uh, you know, solution to problems that affect us all, whether it's climate change or, um, you know, uh, health or, 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 uh, or COVID-19 or, you know, all these things that we have to deal with as a community and that affect us, you know, in, in very different ways. So I, here, I just want to quote this fabulous quote by um, uh, a political theorist and sociologist and civil rights activist from, from uh, the US called uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. He said that the, the real argument for democracy is this, the vast and wonderful, I quote, the vast and wonderful knowledge of this universe is locked in the bosoms of its individual souls to tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and deed, we must appeal not to the few, not to some souls, but to all. And what does that mean? It means like it's not even just about the kind of factual knowledge of different lived in experiences and, and uh, you know, um, experiences with the impact of the economy or, or this or that uh, retirement policy. It's, it's also about more uh, dimensions, uh, like aesthetic dimensions, uh, um, emotional dimensions. There's something about life in common that is enriched by taking seriously each and one of us um, um, as equals, as free and equals. Okay, so if that's the main argument, uh, but you could also appeal to other arguments for why democracy matters, but let's say we have a good argument as to why we want an authentic democracy, not a pseudo one like the one we have. What does it look like? How do we tap this wonderful knowledge that distributed um, among us? Uh, what, what does an authentic democracy look like? So here's where I come in with this vision for a different kind of model, different kind of popular rule. And I ask them to say that I propose this as a, you know, not a blueprint with all the details and not a constitution, but a lens through which we can both diagnose what's wrong with our current system and envision something different and hopefully better uh, for the future. And that should guide uh, institutional reform going forward. So I call that model, this paradigm, this vision, this lens, I call it open democracy. And um, I would say that the, the main characteristic uh, is that in it, legislative power, which for me is the central power in the democracy, the capacity to make laws that govern us all, is something that ordinary citizens are supposed to exert directly at some point in their lives, not all at once, uh, necessarily, because we do need a division of um, labor and it's impossible to deliberate in the millions so far, but in turn. So I basically modernized the ancient ideal of ruling and being ruled in turn. In my language, it becomes representing and being represented in turn. And it's a lot more about um, equal distribution of power than consent to the rulers, which was the dominant sort of uh, normative uh, um, value in, uh, in the 18th century, where, where what people wanted were, was to be able to consent to the rulers. I am ambitioning something uh, closer to actually ruling. So the key body of such a, uh, an open democracy is what I call the open mini public. It's a large randomly selected body of citizens gathered for agenda setting, general lawmaking, or um, you know, uh, solving topical issues. Uh, so that's like to give you sort of like the key sort of um, you know institution, but it would be connected to the larger public through um, crowdsourcing platforms to allow for the collection of information and ideas and, and uh, criticism from the larger public. It would be connected to uh, mini publics at the regional level that would percolate up um, you know proposals and and, and suggestions as well and allow for deliberation at the local level. And eventually uh, it would be connected to moments of mass de de um, direct to democracy. Because as much as I think representation is unavoidable, I also think that the legitimacy of laws and policy also has to come from a moment of mass authorization, right? So you'd have to have more frequent referenda in my system than we currently have in places like um, say France, uh, or, or the US outside perhaps California. So it would be probably closer in that respect to something like to a country like Switzerland, where there are very frequent referenda uh, that allow people to uh, basically make constitutional decisions, right? On, on key issues. 
So the way I structure my, my vision for a you know, more open uh, system is um, through five institutional principles. The first one is the uh, principle of participation rights comes first because the idea is to put power in the hands of ordinary citizens again. Ordinary citizens shouldn't be in the position of only being asked for their opinion every four years in the form of a yes or no, or a up or down vote, you know, a very limited way of expressing your voice. They should have the possibility at any point in time to um, put out a proposal, gather signatures for it. And if, if the proposal gathers a threshold of signatures, uh, have the possibility of having this idea or proposal put to the agenda of parliament, or perhaps maybe if it reaches a very high uh, threshold of, of votes, uh, be sent to a referendum directly to the larger population. They should also have a participation right that allows them to recall laws and policies that they are not satisfied with. Or, you know, if we keep elected officials in that model, elected officials that are not delivering uh, the goods or that they deem not competent enough. Again, with all kinds of mechanisms so that the system is not abused, you don't want total chaos, but it would be a lot more open and fluid and uh, empowering than the current system where we're stuck with corrupt politicians for uh, years or incompetent ones, and you have to wait for the long process of um, you know, um, courts and judges to reach some conclusions for accountability really to kick in and sanctions to kick in. The second principle is deliberation. So I'm committed to uh, a vision of deliberative democracy, uh, you know, we, which is pretty much that of uh, Jürgen Habermas, the idea that we owe each other, each other reasons for the policies and, and laws that we impose on each other. So it's very important that our raw preferences and judgments be passed through the filter of collective deliberation. That's where the knowledge aggregating virtues uh, um, of democracy really uh, you know, take place. That's where you get this uh, collective wisdom and wonderful knowledge that Du Bois talks about to, you know, to, to emerge. Uh, the third principle is um, the principle of uh, major, the, the majoritarian principle. It's this idea that if we live in a democracy, then at key junctures, uh, when we don't know which way to go, then we have to go with the, the majority. Otherwise, we are in a minoritarian rule. And I know that historically we've been very worried about the tyranny of the majority. So we've built in those all these securities against misrule by you know, increasing threshold, super majoritarian threshold, by having second bodies checking the first you know, body. And, but at the end of the day, many of our so-called um, democracies, especially in the US, uh, you end up with the tyranny of the powerful minorities. The NRA prevents massive you know, gun regulation and even though majorities are behind that idea. Uh, it's just, you take one issue after another, there are majorities that are being denied in the US on a number of issues. And I think that's the case in, a, in other countries as well. So I'm, I'm almost done. The, the, the fourth principle is democratic representation by which I don't mean electoral representation. So in my system, you may actually do without uh, elections and elected representatives. You could function with just open assemblies and mini publics, meaning randomly selected bodies. Um, and I've already talked about the central open mini public that would be sort of like the source of legislative power. Finally, the last principle is transparency. Transparency is meant as an accountability mechanism because of course, if you remove the principle, the institution of elect periodic elections, you worry about, okay, how do we maintain some uh, you know, accountability in the system. So I have some ideas about how to do that, but one, one key uh, principle would be to have a lot of transparency about what's being debated, discussed, decided, who is doing what. Um, a lot more again than in our relatively closed system where a lot of the legislative uh, process is actually invisible to most people. So I, I, I'll stop there with this brief sketch um, of, uh, of an open democracy. The idea is that to go from a closed system to an open system where, where power really circulates and ordinary cit citizens can enter the, the, the center of power uh, very easily without any uh, major obstacles. And there are examples, I mean, there are you know, proto examples of what I have in mind in ancient Greece, in classical Athens in particular, in certain experiments like what happened in Iceland, what happened in Ireland, what's recently okay, happened in France. Okay. Back to those later. Uh, yeah, and, and, so, and uh, that's, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Six, and and, and um, you can also think of, of uh, you know, unions and firms as places to implement open democracy. So I'll stop there. I apologize for being a little long.
No, it, it's okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a really good summary in a way of what, what you find in the book. It might be sometimes a little bit theoretical up to now for people, but we'll come in the uh, round that we're going to do after this. We'll come back to some very concrete um, uh, examples of um, citizens panels that have already taken place and what have been the positive points and also the negative points about that. Uh, but we'll follow up on that later. But before we go to that, um, I'm now going to introduce our second um, uh, keynote speaker. That's Roman Ksnarik, who is the um, UK-based philosopher author who has written a book on empathy, which I can also recommend. But the book that I'm very interested in, in, in presenting here is the book, The Good Ancestor. Uh, the undertitle of that book is A Radical Prescription for Long-Term Thinking. Roman sets out in the book that, uh, as I said, our decision makers are very short term uh, decision makers. They think only to the next uh, four or five years maximum. And we need to actually think much longer. Uh, but uh, I'll let the, uh, Roman explain in about 10 minutes uh, what, what, what is in the book him, himself. What are the main messages of your book, uh, Roman? Thanks very much for that introduction, Willie, and really great to hear from Hélène. You know, like Hélène, I'm a critic of representative democracy um, and its oligarchic nature, but I want to focus on this other problem of democracy, really, which is its inherent short-termism. Um, and, and Willie was there talking earlier about the problem of sort of democratic myopia. Um, so in this uh, book I've, I've written, The Good Ancestor, you know, one of the things I point out is that something that we all know, we live in an age of chronic short-termism. Those politicians we all know who can't see beyond the next election or even the latest tweet, businesses that can't see beyond the quarterly report, nations sitting around international conference tables arguing with each other while the planet burns and species disappear. And of course, as individuals, we're clicking our phones and pressing the buy now button. This is the age of the tyranny of the now. And it's clear that I think that we need more long-term thinking to deal with the major challenges of our time. We need it to plan for the next pandemic on the horizon to deal with threats from new technologies like artificial intelligence and bioweapons. We needed to deal with racial injustice and wealth inequality that gets passed on from generation to generation. And of course, we needed to deal with the global ecological crisis. And of course, in there are many issues that affect trade unions um, and their members in lots of different ways, whether it's the technological threats from automation and the impacts of that on jobs, um, the need for long-term investment in job training and education and healthcare to deal with inequalities in society. And of course, the many ways that the ecological crisis is affecting and will increasingly affect um, uh, working people, you know, people in vulnerable uh, employment positions in other ways too. And when I step back and look at this, I, I feel that we've really colonized the future. We treat the future like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological degradation and technological risks as if there was nobody there. And the tragedy of this situation, thinking about democracy, you know, is that future generations aren't here um, to challenge this pillaging of their inheritance. You know, they're given no political rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. And I've, the, one of the ways I think about this is that we need to rethink our ideas of what solidarity is all about. I mean, in the 19th century, trade unions played an incredible role in inventing a new kind of solidarity, solidarity between workers within uh, industries, between industries across borders. But I think we need something in addition to that now. We need solidarity across generations, solidarity through time, intergenerational solidarity. And it's quite difficult, though, I think, to grasp the scale of this challenge of this intergenerational problem. But let me just um, share a few slides with you just to illustrate this. There you can see what I call the scale of unborn generations. There are 7.7 .7 billion of us alive today. In the last 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. And an estimated nearly 7 trillion people will be born over the next 50,000 years, that giant orange circle. And even in the next couple of centuries, tens of billions of people will be born. Amongst them, all your children and their grandchildren and their grandchildren, the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. And there's a real question there of how they're going to remember us for what we did or didn't do when we had the chance. And behind that is a question, well, how do we expand our time horizons? Because we need to be shifting from thinking on a scale of 
seconds, seconds, you know, minutes and, and hours to decades, centuries, and even millennia? How do we even go about doing that? Are we capable of it? And in my book, I talk about there being a tug of war for time going on between six drivers of short-term thinking and six ways to think long-term. Many of the drivers of short-termism are very um, familiar to you, like digital distraction, looking at our phones, the political presentism of electoral cycles, speculative capitalism, and, and so on. And um, I go in the book into these six different ways to think long-term, but just to say briefly one big point here, which is that long-term thinking isn't always good for us. You know, a former head of Goldman Sachs, Gus Levy, once said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. In other words, long-termism can be directed towards very narrow and self-seeking ends, the same way like the regime in North Korea wants to exist and pass on power and privilege from generation to generation. Um, and the six ways to think long-term are really there to challenge that idea of narrow and self-seeking um, uh, long-termism. And I just want to just focus on one particular aspect of this, or one of the six ways, um, which I think is relevant to this discussion we've got today, which is the idea of intergenerational justice. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is all about thinking about how do we bring the voices and interests of future generations into political decision-making today? And I think it's really vital because, look, you can have all the sustainable development goals in the world that you like, but if your political systems are still caught in short-termism, it's going to be very difficult to um, do anything or reach those targets. And I'm particularly interested in this issue because I used to be a political scientist many years ago. I was apparently an expert on democratic governments and democratic theory, and it never once occurred to me in that time that we, in a way, disenfranchise future generations in some ways similar to the way women or indigenous peoples have been disenfranchised in the past, that we don't give them representation. So how do we bring them into the political world? How do we give them voice? So uh, in my book, I talk about four different ways to do this. And I'm gonna just go through these very briefly, the idea of guardians of the future, citizens assembly, intergenerational rights and self-governing city states. Um, and the first one is the idea of a guardian of the future. So the idea of having uh, political positions that represent the interests of future generations. And this happens in the world, right? There are many examples of this. So in Wales, for example, there's a future generations commissioner, a non-party political position. Um, and there's a picture of the future generations commissioner there, Sophie Howe. Her um, job is to look at the impact of public policy in employment, healthcare, education, environment, all areas up to 30 years uh, from today. And in fact, I'm part of a campaign for the whole UK to have a future generations commission, not commissioner, um, but something quite similar to that, which is informed by citizens panels, the mini publics that Ellen is talking about. So this is one kind of model, but as my 12 year old daughter says, she critiques this model. She says, why should I trust that one person, you know, a commissioner, a guardian to represent my interests and the interests of all my friends and all kinds of different people in society from different social backgrounds. There's a kind of problem of democratic legitimacy there. So another option is the second one I talk about, the idea of citizens assemblies or mini public citizens panels, intergenerational juries, this kind of idea where you have representatives from different parts of society engaged in that great democratic uh, 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 practice of, of participatory or deliberative democracy. And this is a very interesting example of that, a kind of version of it from Japan. Uh, it's called, it's a local government decision-making movement called Future Design. And what Future Design does is they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And they typically divide them into two groups. Half are told they're residents from the present day. And the other half are given these ceremonial robes to wear that you can see there, the orange robes, and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. And it turns out the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative plans for their towns and city, whether it's long-term investment in healthcare and education, action on automation, taking action on climate change, many other areas. And this movement is now spreading throughout Japan. It's used in big cities like Kyoto, even Japan's Ministry of Finance. Um, so there's real energy around this kind of um, sort of citizen engagement, direct citizen engagement. And there's systematic evidence showing that they they tend to have a longer term view of the future um, than your regular politicians. Their discount rates are different. I mean, and we can go into the details of that. So that's a sort of second model, you know. Um, a third model, and this is something Willie mentioned, which is the importance of legal campaigns 
to secure the rights for future generations. In the US, here's an image here of a group of 21 young people who are suing the US federal government. Um, uh, and it's being done on behalf of uh, an organization called Our Children's Trust is doing it on their behalf. They're campaigning for the legal right to a safe climate and healthy atmosphere for both current and future generations. This is you know, one of the most important shifts in the history of rights since the French Revolution, the idea of trying to give rights to not just to young people when they're older, but to unborn future generations. This is a David versus Goliath struggle, but they've informed struggles in other countries as well. As many of you know, in Germany recently, the Constitutional Court passed a major ruling basically saying that the government was failing in terms of intergenerational justice because of the um, limited uh, carbon emission uh, targets that they have in Netherlands. There's the agenda case, similar cases in Pakistan. The language and the campaigns for intergenerational justice in the legal system are growing and growing and growing. And the fourth area is about decentralization. Here's a sort of slightly playful map I made of imagining Europe as a confederation of city states. Um, and the point here is that if we want to have more long termism politics, we need more um, uh, decentralization of power. Look at a city like Amsterdam, which has taken long termism increasingly seriously. Look at their um, circular economy targets, for example, to be 100% circular, no material waste by 2050. 50% uh, circular by 2030 and 10% city procurement circular by 2022. So these are all different ways of trying to bring the uh, interests of future generations into politics. And one final thing, just to finish here, in my book, I describe an intergenerational solidarity index, which measures the long-term public policy across 10 different indicators of environmental, uh, social, and uh, economic indicators, long-term public policy of, of the nation state level. It ranks these 122 countries. Some countries do really well, Iceland and Sweden. The UK, where I come from, is way down the list, number 45 out of 122, the US number 65. The point here, though, is that we need to hold governments to account for their public policy when it comes to long-termism. And I think there's probably a role for trade unions to play there too. So ultimately, let me just finish here and say, look, this is all about being a good ancestor, to borrow a phrase from the great immunologist Jonas Selk. And there's a question there about what can trade unions do to bring being a good ancestor into the realm of politics today, democracy today, and to tackle the great social and ecological challenges of our time. And I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. And uh, I think lots of inte intelligent, very interesting uh, um, ideas there. I especially like your reinventing Europe as city-states, which I think is kind of to overcome your Brexit problem that you guys <laughs> created. So uh, well well done with, with that one. But uh, joking aside, um, what I'm going to do now is to follow up with some questions for Helene and, and for you uh, after your presentations. Um, the, my questions are a bit based on your books that I've read, but also on some of the uh, issues that you came up with now in, 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 today, in the, today's presentations. First for um, um, uh, Helene. Uh, Helene, you have been a member of quite a number of citizens panels, or you have certainly also in the book you write about some of them. You already mentioned the Icelandic one. Uh, you have a few others. Um, what are kind of the positive things that you've learned from those experiences? Maybe you can talk a little bit of some of the experiments that you were involved, but also I would like to know how do you evaluate them? Were there positive things? What was negative? What did you learn which you could do better next time within those citizens panels? So if you could uh, talk for a few minutes about those experiments that you uh, participated in. So I didn't participate in that many. I have I've researched many of them, but I've really only uh, you know uh, done something in Finland, a crowdsourcing experiment, and and been a sort of like observant of uh, observer of the Convention for Climate. But I'll tell you that this has been very transformative. So I came in, you know, I, I came to these questions from a very theoretical angle, and so I had these abstract commitments to democracy and you know equality and, and respect for ordinary citizens. But the fact is that at heart, I think I was still, like many of us, if you really you know, um, scrutinize your, your, your true feelings, an, an elitist and, and a bit of an aristocrat, you know, like our whole education system, which I'm you know, a product of, infuses us with this belief that people who know should be at the top. And then you have this belief that, well, politics does require knowledge, expertise. 
So surely we need to include people, but only either to select decision makers or like to tell us about what they want in a sort of like orientation towards pure, you know, the, the, their preferences. So what this um, what participation in this experiment showed me is that actually people are not just good at talking about values and their preferences in an abstract way. They, they have a ton of local knowledge and, and capacity for problem solving and you know frameworks that are extremely rich and interesting and diverse and that we do not come close to really um, using and utilizing in our, in our existing political systems. So I came to this thinking, well, uh, for sure, you know, these uh, bodies should be used for agenda setting. They should tell us what to do and then we let the people who know more, politicians, you know, experts, decide about the means, uh, how to get those ends served. Turns out that's also false and then not enough. I think that what the French uh, Citizen Convention for Climate, so, which basically tasked 150 randomly selected citizens um, with uh, the, the, you know, coming up with solutions to, to um, coming, coming up with ways to curb greenhouse uh, gas emissions, proved is that citizens can actually legislate. That, that really the big leap for me that, that this did is that they, they, they should be in the room where the law is made. They shouldn't just be up, you know, upstream of the process telling us basically a, a, you know, what the framework for the law should be, or they shouldn't be just downstream of the process, validating and ratifying decisions made by experts or you know, professional politicians. They should be in the room, driving, uh, in the driving seat, and experts and perhaps elected officials should be supporting them, um, helping them, and basically those should be on top but not on top. So that, that's really what it did to me. It really proved to me that um, the, the core intuition of the Greeks was right. When it comes to issues of the common good, we all have a, we should all have a say and, and be the one making the decisions. Yeah, but if I if I may come to the uh, the, the convention in, in, in France, the Citizens Convention for Climate, um, in, indeed, um, it, it was quite a, a good success as far as I see in terms of participation, ideas that came out of it. But the problem is that the, the Macron government, then in a way, who had also made a lot of fuss about it and in the end decided not to follow a lot of these recommendations, which made a lot of people that actually participated in the process very unhappy and made them probably very skeptical about doing future uh, citizens panels on these issues, because if uh, the politicians, the elites don't listen to what then comes out of these citizens panels, well, what's the use? Uh, yeah, so, exactly. For instance, I know that there was a, there was a, there was a proposal which I think some people in the in the in the trade union might might like or might even find a little bit going too far. But there was a proposal for a twenty-five hour working week, if I'm not mistaken, in there. And of course, that way too, too, passed, way too radical passed. for. Yes. That one was never passed. It didn't make it to the final. Uh, I thought okay. I thought it did. But any, anyway, there were other uh, I, uh, ideas, other recommendations, which also then in a way were not followed up on by, by, by the government. So what can, um, can we do about that if you believe in, in open democracy? Well, you, you realize that getting from here to there is going to be a fight. And you're right, in the French case, you know, there was this great promise and then very little was delivered by Macron in the end and his government. Similarly in Iceland, you know, the process that gave me all these ideas in the first place uh, the constitution was written by 25 ordinary, more or less ordinary citizens on the basis of uh, the, the, the suggestions of a forum of 950 randomly selected citizens. They crowdsourced the draft, they put them to a referendum, two thirds of the voting population said yes, it was a great constitutional proposal, and then parliament killed it. So it didn't work either there. But these are two data points, you have to look elsewhere for, you know, hope in a way, um, you know, in Ireland, they did great work with uh, two uh, randomly selected citizen assemblies in 2012 and 2016 that passed uh, respectively uh, marriage equality for uh, gay people and uh, the decriminalization of abortion in 2018 through a referendum based on the recommendations of the mini public. So it can work. And in fact, at this point, the OECD has um, you know, documented over 400 cases of mini publics of this type. Uh, not all of them very influential, but they, they, we we're still in a, in, in a phase of experimentation and the next phase will be institutionalization. 
And it's going to be hard, and there's going to be a lot of resistance from the power players who feel threatened by these new forms of citizen participation and, and in fact, citizen representation, in my view. Of course, elected parliaments feel threatened uh, because they think they have the monopoly of democratic legitimacy. They think they are the only representatives uh, and that no one else can be a democratic representative. So how do we negotiate this transition? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure, but it will be a combination of activism, um, you know, uh, negotiation with the established powers and uh, the work of people like me, like trying to visualize something different and vulgarize it and share it and convince people that it's it's solidly uh, you know, established at least on a theoretical uh, level. So that's how I see and things. Let me let me follow up with a, with a, with another question. Um, if if we would go for more of these citizens panels and they get really influential in helping uh, decision makers to come up with uh, with real decisions. Um, what about accountancy? Uh, because up to now, of course, in our electoral system that we have now, well, every four years, you can hold politicians accountable for the bad mistakes that they made. I'm sure that uh, all those citizens panels could probably use all the collective wisdom, but they might make some mistakes or even come up with some very bad recommendations. But how do you hold them accountable afterwards? Yes, this issue of accountability is very important, but I just want to point out that for one thing, accountability through elections is not that great. Uh, you know, George Bush, you know, launched a, a war uh, on Iraq based on lies, and was he held accountable? No, he was re-elected. You know, Trump was not re-elected, but really had like to mess up considerably on, on the management of the pandemic. So elections are a very blunt mechanism for accountability. You can only keep people accountable for a bundle of issues. It's not a scalpel. It's a very blunt you know, tool. Uh, additionally, people mix up different notions under this notion of accountability. They, they, they usually mean sanctionability. But accountability is primarily about giving accounts. And actually, mini publics are much better at doing that because they are a lot more deliberative and discursive than parliaments. In parliaments, people try to score points. There's a lot of spin, a lot of lies, uh, a lot of rhetoric. But the giving of accounts is, is actually pretty minimal. So yes, elections allow us to sanction, but we could use other mechanisms to sanction bad rulers, bad uh, autocratic representatives. You could have ethics committee. Uh, you know, punishing people who engage in corrupt practices or unethical practices. Um, you could also, you know, these mechanisms that I mentioned before, participation rights. If people are not happy with the policies put forward by a mini public, well, they can recall them, you know, through uh, these processes I was uh, talking about. Um, so I just think we need to be a lot more imaginative. And, and, and this question of accountability, it, it's the beginning of a conversation for me. It's not a a showstopper. And usually, people, when people bring that up, they're like, "Oh well, but accountability." I, I don't think that's uh, that ends the conversation. Okay. Um, one last question for you, and then I have a few follow-up questions for for Roman. The last question I have for you is that actually, you know, the EU has a new process going, which is about thinking about the future of of Europe, and they are having some kind of citizens panel. There, have you actually get uh, read about that, and what are your views on what the EU is trying to do with this citizens involvement? Is it uh, real or is it uh, just some uh, show or something? What What do you think of those uh, of those uh, processes? So I I want to be charitable. I think it's uh, it's the intentions are there and it's um, it's real that they're, they're, they're doing it, they're trying it, but. It's very timid. Uh, it's not talked about much. Uh, they, they didn't empower the, the process enough to, I think, uh, make it influential, visible, talked about. So in the end, it's going to be a deliberation among a very narrow group of people. Uh, and I, I don't fully blame them. I think these, these things take time. And the lessons from the great national debate uh, you know, were not fully taken on board, and because I think they copied the design of uh, Macron's great national debate uh, to a large degree. But it seems to me that at the top, where well, those decisions are made and authorized, there's not enough true belief in uh, all the things I've talked about, open democracy, people's power, equality. I think, I think we, we, there's a generational um, 
change that had to happen for so that younger people with these kind of true commitments bring bring to power the real will to change things. Right now, to me, it sounds it ends up being, you know, uh, it, it ends up looking a lot like participation washing rather than actual, you know, uh, decentering of power, surrendering of power, sharing of power, which it should be. But but you know, it's better than nothing. I think we it's good to try it and 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 so you know learn from the. So small steps that are being made, but if you, if you look at what's being done, I mean, these kind of things should have been done 50 years ago when we were building the European Union, so that by now we would have so much more, uh, you know, uh, knowledge and practice, and and uh, and we would we would be so much further along. Thank you, Helen. Um, before I give the floor to uh, to um, uh, Ludovic, I'm I have one or two short questions for, for you, uh, Roman. The first, in a way, is this short-termism in politics. Where does it actually come from? Because I have the impression that the political elites in the 50s and 60s, especially the fathers of the European Union and others, were much more visionary then, and were thinking a little bit, not in very long generations, but were uh, at least thinking a bit more long-term. Whereas now, uh, politics apparently has lo lost all long-term vision. Does that have anything to do with the fact that uh, politicians now is not a vocation anymore, but it's mu much more like, like a profession? Uh, is that it? Or, or what do you see as the cause of this long-term vision uh, uh, that politicians don't, do not have anymore? What's, what's the reason behind that, according to you? Yeah, it's a good question, because I think the easy answer people, you know, will often say, well, it's all to do with the rise of 24 seven media, the fact that the politicians are responding to, you know, the next headline, the next tweet, the focus groups and, and so on. And so they're failing to see long term or they're increasingly um, under the control of uh, vested interests, corporate interests. The, and those corporate interests, of course, are focused on their own short term interests, whether it's extraction of oil or whatever it happens to be, uh, other fossil fuels. I think when it comes to European Union, um, I think, you know, and going back to the 1950s, there's something else going on there, which was the of course, the, the rise of European institutions um, and many long term institutions came out of the crisis of the Second World War. You know, whether it's the EU that came out of the ashes of the war, the world uh, health organization in Britain, the National Health Service. And I think when we go through moments of crisis, these are moments for potential um, rethinking on a longer sort of intergenerational basis. Um, and of course, that's in a way potentially what COVID-19, you know, could could be or could have been uh, too. So, um, you know, but of course, the idea of short termism in politics is not new. You know, politicians in across Europe in the 19th century were also uh, you know, there was discussions about short termism at, at, at those moments as well. But I think we, you know, what's changed really is that perhaps never before in, in human history have our actions and public policies had such potentially damaging impacts on future generations. Um, and clearly that, you know, you can have different starting dates for that. You can go back to the first nuclear test on July 16th, 1945. Uh, the so-called Trinity test in the United States, that was the moment when humanity had the potential to destroy its own future, but clearly because of impacts of things like the um, climate change, ocean acidification and so on, and uh, technological risks like AI and bioweapons, there's more and more importance of needing to you know, think long-term and all those short-term forces seem even um, more problematic. And of course, you know, at the core of it all is the idea of electoral cycles you know, and um, trying to get beyond that sort of design problem. And that, of course, links to what Ellen's talking about, because, you know, citizens panels in various ways are moving beyond the, that kind of short termism. You know, I've taken part in citizens assemblies as an expert witness, you know, like in there's something I was part of recently, something called the North of Time Climate Assembly in the UK, where they wanted to have a, an expert come in and talk to them about long term thinking. That was at the local and regional government level. 50 random members of the public. Um, and it was fantastic for all the reasons that Ellen said, it was sort of genuine kind of deliberation. And of course there are problems with this, um, that politicians don't wanna listen, that they ignore the results. But I think we're at the earliest stages 
of learning about how to reinvent what democracy looks like, trying to learn from you know, that old ancient Greek idea of direct democracy, but of course, widening the, the franchise more beyond um, you know, just men, male citizens. And then I think we can equally learn from workplace democracy here too. You know, the way that trade unions have historically been practicing and advocating participatory democracy in the workplace. And there's learning there, I think, potentially to take into the whole citizen assembly movement that, you know, that's a question. I don't know what the answer to that is, but maybe trade unions can help us deal with some of those challenges that you're putting to Elena about um, mini publics and how they function. Okay. Thank you, Roman. One, one, one last question, um, which actually I got yesterday when I was listening to the uh, State of the Union speech by our president uh, van der Leyen. She um, announced, uh, I think uh, rightly so, that the, the EU is going to take some extra uh, steps to, to help the young, because the young young people these days have been really affected by, by the COVID crisis in terms of their uh, education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in terms also of, of, of other issues, uh, of not being able to assemble what young people like to do. So uh, that is certainly a thing. There was also a report yesterday in the media uh, quite well of the anxiety that young people are facing because of the, uh, the climate emergency. Now, the question I got is uh, because I heard uh, President van der Leyen say, well, what we will do for them is to have in 2022, a year of the young. And when I hear that, I got like, okay, um, is that really something that the young should applaud for? Is it, would it not be better that future generations, young people would have a voice in policy making? Therefore, would you think the idea that you had in Wales with a commissioner for future generations, if the EU thought a little bit about having a, and at European level, uh, a commission or a commissioner for future generations, would that not be a much better idea than just having the next year of this or the next year of that? Just a bit of a provocative question there. Yeah, it's interesting actually, because I, I was recently reading the EU's um, 2021 foresight report. You know, and one of the things I noticed about it, and this was just a couple of days ago, I was just sort of flicking through it. I couldn't find the word future generations in it. Yeah. Right? There was no sense. You know, it was all about forecasting various things, you know, which comes from a very different political positioning, not about issues of social, ecological or intergenerational justice. Um, and, and so there's a real lack there, I think, at the European level about taking the interests and rights of future generations seriously. Uh, I think represented in that foresight report, um, and I and I agree with you. The idea of a you know a, 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 a year of the young is it's a bit like um, you know in, in in London at Christmas it says help the homeless at Christmas big posters. Well, then what about for the rest of the year? So you have a year of the young in 2022 and forget it after that. No, I, I absolutely think all of these things need to be institutionalized more in the design of democracy itself. And one of the ways is, as you suggest, through some, having some kind of commission, commissioner, maybe based on the Welsh model for Europe. Should, um, maybe people listening may not know, but recently, uh, except for last week, the UN Secretary General, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the power or the potential of multi multilateral institutions, though I support changes there. But I was really pleased to see the UN Secretary General saying that they're going to appoint a UN special envoy for future generations. Um, that's a big and important shift, of course, it may not have much power to begin with, but there's something important going on there. In a way, the EU is getting left behind by not having a future generations envoy or commission or commissioner. And let me just say something briefly about what we're doing in the UK, this campaign I mentioned called Today for Tomorrow, which is for the UK to have a future generations commission. There's a bill in the UK Parliament right now, which is modelled on the Welsh bill, it's called the it's called the Wellbeing for Future Generations Bill. And, the, and I've been involved in helping draft that bill and campaigning for it. And the idea is to move away from that idea of having that single commissioner like they have in Wales and having a commission. And we've created a kind of a shadow commission to model it, of which there are eight people. Four of them are experts from the four 
nations of the UK from Northern Ireland, Wales, um, uh, uh, Scotland and England. So I'm the England expert. And then there's four young people who are part of it as well. Um, but the idea is not to just rely on expertise. In the bill, the idea is that there would be a commission that would be informed by a panel of 50 citizens, very much along the lines of the stuff that Ellen's talking about, to give it democratic legitimacy, um, to have open public debate, um, and to make, make sure that that Future Generations Commission is accountable, um, not just to members of parliament, but to citizens as well. And that commission would also have the power to take public bodies to court for failing to reach uh, targets or to um, comply with the recommendations of the commission as well. So dealing in a way legally with some of those problems that citizens assemblies often have, which is the politicians, uh, as we just heard, just ignore them sometimes. So I think there's great potential for, um, for the European Union to think about in these institutional design shifts around democratic representation of the interests of future people. Thank you very much, Roman. I'm now going to turn to, to my neighbor here, to Ludovic, uh, Ludovic Wood, who is um, the Confederal Secretary for the uh, ETUC, European Trade uh, Union Confederation. And uh, Ludovic, you've heard a lot of interesting uh, views there on how to reimagine democracy. Um, are you happy about some of the things that you heard? And are you sometimes also afraid of some of the things you heard? So. I give you like 10 minutes to, uh, I see you have taken a lot of notes. So there's lots of stuff I think you can, uh, can bring up. So please use your 10 minutes as, uh, as useful as you can. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will try to, uh, to have some uh, comments uh, and general thoughts uh, also on uh, the role of trade union and, and uh, the perception of, uh, of democracy also, uh, how trade union are also actors of uh, democracy. I think it's, it's good also that we have this discussion on democracy link uh, to, uh, to topics like uh, climate, as it was mentioned, but also the question of uh, equality, because democracy is not a disembodied subject. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a link uh, to, uh, and this is where uh, also trade union come uh, into uh, the, um, the image. It's a uh, link to the question of different interest group that we have in society. So it's not possible just to discuss uh, around the table without taking into account that there are different interests in uh, society uh, that um, and that the society is uh, and is still led uh, by uh, by a few of us uh, only a few of us uh, our economy is uh, uh, is uh, as it is and we uh, as uh, the ma majority of people uh, most of them in Europe organized in trade unions but uh, not only uh, we have our interest to to make heard uh, in the uh, debate and try to influence also uh, the, the debate so that uh, the democracy can work and take into account, uh, account our uh, different interests. That's why I think, of course, trade unions are actors of democracy, but are also different type of actors uh, because it's also we are also actors of the long term. Uh, when uh, you would say that, um, yeah, po politicians are more dependent on electoral cycles, uh, when trade unions can have a, a long-term uh, vision and then also a long-term thinking, uh, also with tools that can have long-term effect. Uh, if you uh, if you are able to bargain a collective agreement uh, that is redistributive in uh, different sectors, it has long-term effect that can go uh, after electoral cycle. So uh, it's also something that we have to take into account. It's that we have tools at our disposal uh, with trade unions to, to make her the voice of workers and to have um, yeah, long-term effect. It means also that as actors of democracy, we are also, and we need the, uh, the legitim uh, legitimacy of our membership. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we are actors with membership. So it's not uh, that we are elected uh, by groups uh, in uh, uh, society, but we have members and we are uh, there to defend their, uh, their interest. But this interest is also, of course, linked to the vision of society that we can define and defend uh, as uh, trade unions. This vision of society as always been uh, the defense of uh, social justice, the defense of equality at the center uh, of our vision, the fight for democracy. And I think it's also important to recognize that uh, with different progressive forces, but trade unions have always been also at the center in the fight for democracy. 
when democracy was in danger and is still in danger in a lot of the parts of the world. Uh, trade unions have been in the, at the forefront of the fight against fascism, and also trade unions have been one of the first victims of authoritarian regime in history, but not all, only in history, when we see uh, all our um, yeah, comrades uh, in Colombia, in the Filipina, are murdered uh, when uh, they attack uh, different uh, interests uh, that uh, uh, for uh, yeah to defend uh, the interest of uh, of the workers. So it shows also that uh, the fight for democracy is also at the center of the work uh, of uh, trade unions because we are also uh, a certain counter power, uh, a counter power or an institutionalized power. It depends, of course, of uh, the tradition and the, how the trade unions uh, have developed in the different countries, but uh, with the same goal at the, uh, at the beginning, the, the, the goal of having an influence uh, to defend uh, the different uh, interests, not the individual interest of the workers, but the collective interest of the workers. So I mentioned, of course, the question of collective bargaining that can have a uh, long-term effect, uh, and that is also, of course, important then to take into account in the discussion on, uh, I will come back on the discussion on climate, but it means also that we have tools where we can take into account the, the interest of the future, uh, the interest of the workers and match uh, this uh, social and climate uh, interest in uh, the tools that we have our, at our disposal uh, to, to make some uh, changes. Um, to come back on the, the fact that we also bargain as trade unionists uh, between uh, different interest groups, uh, uh, work representative of workers and representative of companies or companies that, uh, directly, uh, this cannot be lost uh, and dissolved uh, in uh, only, uh, there cannot be only the question of representative democracy or the question of uh, direct democracy, participative democracy, because in the middle, there is also this uh, intermediate, intermediate corps that represent interest and that are complementary and that have to be taken uh, into account uh, there because uh, yeah, in the workplace, uh, in the workplace, what we see is that even if uh, outside of the workplace, democracy can exist with elections, uh, even if between elections there are not a lot of topics on which you ask the uh, citizens to, uh, to participate, that's a problem. But in the workplace, democracy is often not uh, uh, institutionalized and uh, often it's, uh, it's really a problem for workers to influence uh, the decision uh, in the workplace and that's why uh, trade union are there to try to uh, uh, to organize and collectively bargain and what is decided in workplace by companies by shareholders of companies has of course an important um, consequence uh, on our uh, society so that's not something that we can leave uh, uh, leave uh, without uh, trying to influence it so it means also that there in collaborations with other forces in the different uh, different spheres, trade unions are allies uh, of the different uh, progressive forces uh, to influence uh, the yeah the economic democracy, the workplace uh, democracy. That's what makes me speak about maybe climate, uh, so that we can also uh, see what we can do there. Um, it's it's clear that when you you look at climate policies that are discussed uh, a lot uh, these days with the Green Deal, the Fit for 55 package, uh, etc., the cl different climate policies have effects directly uh, socially, uh, often on the most vulnerable in society, workers, communities. So if you speak about pollution, of course, communities. If you speak about loss in jobs uh, about uh, workers. Uh, so it's also important to have democracy in this uh, discussion about uh, climate policies uh, to lead the transition uh, in a fair way to keep the trust of workers and communities. Because the question of trust uh, is also at, uh, at the center of the discussion, because we cannot just lead the climate transition without taking into account the social aspect. Because if you do that, of course, it's possible, but it will lead to more inequalities. And if it leads to more inequality, people will turn their back to climate policies. They vo will vote uh, more and more for the extreme right. That will be the parties that will say to them, uh, you don't have to pay for that, uh, you don't have to think about the future. So this is also something that's in our vision of society, it's something we cannot leave uh, in the end uh, of uh, the uh, extreme right parties. And it, it means that we need to put at the center of the discussion of climate policy, the question of trust, and then, of course, the question of decision, uh, so that people can participate in this decision. So I think it means that 
for sure for us in trade unions, uh, we have the workplace uh, to influence the climate policy. So also we can bring the question of climate policies in the workplace, uh, in our collective uh, bargaining agreements, uh, in our actions. Uh, and uh, it means also that local communities affected uh, people uh, at regional level, at local level should have a voice. And there we are allies uh, and we have to develop different kinds of uh, democ uh, democratic uh, practices to ensure that we can uh, have uh, have this, uh, because yeah, if I take only uh, an example, we have the steel industry. We need steel. Uh, we will continue to need steel uh, for all kind of product that we use. But if we do this transition uh, while leaving to the companies to do what they want, uh, they will uh, they will delocalize this production. It will go to China. People will lose their jobs. It will continue to pollute. It will uh, continue to increase the, uh, the the warming of our planet. So it means that if we want to discuss this, uh, we have to discuss this also in a fair and uh, fair way. It means that uh, we need to green this industry here in Europe. Uh, ensure that there's job uh, for people in Europe, here in Europe, but that also we take into account the effects on uh, the affected communities because the pollution that it can uh, bring, the steel industry, we have to take it into account. So there I see a lot of possibilities of discussions uh, to take into account the trends in the economy, uh, not speaking, uh, we could also speak about digitalization of the economy. So uh, here we, uh, you have to anticipate also that if we invest in digitalization of the economy, it can either go uh, to more money in the pockets of the shareholder or improve the working conditions or doing both. Uh, but at one moment, we have to discuss uh, this, and this is also what trade unions are doing uh, day by day. About open um, democracy and the question of citizens' panel, it's not that I fear citizens' panels. Uh, I think that uh, it's important, as, as I said here, that there are also different roles. Uh, there are different interest groups, there are different ways of uh, doing democracy, and it means that in alliance uh, with progressive forces, trade units have also the role of transforming the workplace. It means that this cannot be uh, uh, dissolved, deleted, uh, and what we see is that the problem is, of course, not citizens' panel. The question is all uh, citizens' panel are also instrumentalized often by uh, politicians, uh, to uh, to say, okay, this is the voice of people, that's what people think, I have direct uh, contact with people uh, on the ground, uh, this is what they want, and then you put aside uh, the, uh, the organized democracy that exists, uh, the discussion with trade unions, the discussion with uh, NGOs, etc. So, uh, citizens panel have, of course, to be uh, encouraged, the question, and then, of course, as it was said, um, it's not often that they are uh, listened to, uh, if they are not instrumentalized, uh, it's not often that they are listened to. And there, of course, I agree, we have to fight for. And it's as we do in, in unions. Uh, there's democracy in unions where we decide then the demands that we have, and then we have to fight for it. And uh, so we have the same uh, different uh, problems is that we have to fight for it and try uh, to uh, mobilize and then uh, gain uh, our uh, demands. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ludo. Uh, I think it's quite interesting, some of the examples you mentioned. And um, I, I just think about something, or let me say, first of all, I think the democracy experience that trade unions have kind of already show that when you involve the workers into the decision-making, it is very positive. That could also be a an argument for Helene to say the more you involve citizens into the decision making, the better the decision making probably is, is going to be. And I just read today a story about the Tata steel plant uh, in, in Belgium here, where actually the employers wanted to use uh, blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen to, to better for a new for, for producing steel in a more greener way. But blue hydrogen has use of capture and capture car carbon capture and storage, which is kind of a technology which a lot of people uh, are questioning: is it feasible? And actually, what the trade unions in that state of uh, steel plant did was to push for yes, hydrogen, but green hydrogen. It should be sustainable. So there, in a way, the, the trade unions convinced the plant to actually go for the correct green solution and not for the intermediate kind of a, yes, we still, but we still will have a little bit of carbon, but okay, we'll try to capture it. 
solution. Just to give you that example where I think trade unions play an important role and where also I think citizens in citizens panels could have a positive uh, influence. On the other hand, and I picked that up from one of the questions in the, uh, in the uh, audience here, is that some people are saying, yeah, that's all right and good, but um, doesn't the voice of people lead, like for instance, in the Brexit referendum to the wrong uh, answers, to the wrong questions and the wrong answers. So um, could citizens panels LN also be used by the elites in a negative way? So you organize to make sure that some of the things that might be necessary for to solve some of the planetary issues, the planetary crisis issues, that uh, they, they take the in organized citizens panels to make sure that they get uh, a voice which is more into the direction that they want than in what uh, kind of the future really wants. So could, could citizens panels lead to more populism? Well, so I think it's harder to instrumentalize a, a citizens assembly than, than perhaps a referendum in a way because you, you control less the nature of the deliberations, even if you set the agenda in a constrained way. So, you know, referenda, you, you, you know, the Brexit is one data point. Again, I wouldn't conclude necessarily too much about the value of referenda. It's a larger discussion, but like it's one data point and the meaning of it is very contested, et cetera, et cetera. Take the Citizens Convention for Climate. Um, you know, you could say, and it was the suspicion initially, including of the people who got chosen to be on that panel, that Macron was just trying to use that um, Citizens Convention to uh, pass his carbon tax, the carbon tax that had failed to pass the following winter, the, the previous winter, right? That the, the carbon tax that basically triggered the universe movement. So, okay, we can do it through, you know, regular, legislation, how about we get a convention to agree with us that this is a great way to fight climate change and then it will have the aura of like, people's uh, will and, and then we'll get it done that way. Well, guess what? Like the citizens on the convention, they listen to expert after expert telling them carbon tax, carbon tax, you know, price signal, price signal, that's the only way. They said, no, we're not doing a carbon tax. We don't want it. We know the French people don't want it. There are a million other things we can do we're going to start with those million other things before we get to that sort of like unfair solution in their view, right? Because this is a, a blanket sort of solution that affects people very differentially. And so, so they went for very different solutions, including this radical idea of a global retrofitting of all houses and public buildings by 2030 with massive subsidies to low-income families and people who couldn't necessarily, didn't necessarily have the savings to pay for those uh, renovations. Well, that was going to be a major level uh, lever of carbon reduction. And of course, the government didn't follow suit because what they wanted was the carbon tax, right? So see, it's not that simple. So what they, so they, they, will it feed more populism in the end? Possibly, because if you look like you're pretending to listen to people, whether through, you know, uh, referenda or uh, mini publics, and then you don't, then you get more populism as, as you should, frankly, because when, when we had a referendum in France about the constitutional treatises and people said, we don't want more Europe, the government proceeded to ignore the results. Now we had a convention that said, we want to fight you know, climate change in this and that way and do all these bold things. And the government said, oh, okay, well, we're just going to do the things we already wanted to do and ignore the rest. What do you expect? Like, of course, it's going to feed the Marine Le Pen vote. Um, is that the fault of the public? No, it's the fault of uh, people who use them the wrong way. So, Can I say a word while I'm at it? I'm sorry, just one minute, because I just want to re react to uh, Ludovic's um, uh, you know, presentation. I, I am ambivalent actually about the role of, uh, of um, trade unions and, and trade union representatives because uh, the CESE, our third legislative chamber, which is uh, where uh, representatives of uh, organized civil society, including representatives of trade unions meet, was actually a little bit hostile to uh, mini publics because they too, like elected representatives, feel threatened by this eruption of ordinary citizens in the public as if, you know, they were more legitimate than, than these samples to make recommendations. And there's something about the inner organization of unions 
that is profoundly undemocratic as well, like the way it's run, very untransparent. So it, are there some ways in which you, you too should do some soul searching about the way you appoint your representatives, the way you run your meetings, the way, you know, the, the, the sort of agonistic approach to politics that has caused you to lose, um, I mean, support in the population, there's been a, a disaffection towards unions the same way there's been a disaffection towards parties. So I'm putting this out there as a provocation since you know, you're my audience today. I'm curious how you would push back. You have the right to, to push back uh, Ludovic, just- uh, At least, I don't know if, if it's the case in all, uh, in all countries, but uh, uh, you were mentioning the question of mistrust against political parties uh, in, uh, in service. When, when people are asked on their trust toward trade unions, this is uh, way uh, higher than uh, for political parties. So, so the, I'm not saying that they agree exactly on all what the unions are saying, but on uh, the, the, uh, I think it was in, on, uh, in Belgium, the, the sample and the service said 70% of people were supporting uh, the goal of, uh, of unions. So uh, there we can see also that we are, I think, when you look at political parties and you look at unions, unions are bigger than political parties. So it means also that uh, even if democracy is unperfect because democracy is unperfect because when there's a lot of people, it's difficult to organize democracy. And it's even more difficult to organize democracy when you are a counter power. So if you cannot decide, uh, if what you decide, uh, you cannot transform it, uh, which is not the case for political parties, they are elected. So it means also that they can decide uh, directly. Uh, it's also, there are a lot of expectations, and when you raise expectations, it's difficult to, uh, when you uh, do not transform it, uh, to, uh, to continue to have the trust. But uh, we are among the organizations that have, I think, the most trust. It doesn't mean that we don't need uh, to, to also have a look on uh, our practices. I completely uh, uh, agree uh, to that. And on the aspect of, yeah, do we, uh, are we in favor of citizens' panel or not? I think it's exactly the question I, I mentioned is, if we feel that citizens panel are instrumentalized to counter the voice of uh, the organized society, yes, in that case, maybe when you ask the question to uh, the organized society on what they think on the citizens panel, they would say, yeah, no, uh, we have a voice, we represent uh, so many hundreds of thousands of people and you have to hear us. Um, but the question is that I think it has to be complementary and then I would elaborate also maybe on the the aspect that you mentioned with referendum, Brexit, etc., and uh, and that people can uh, it can lead to uh, to to bad choice. Uh, I think we cannot also uh, put the blame on people to say no when you have never asked them what they want, uh, uh, what uh, what they want. So uh, there are elections every five uh, years or four years, and then in between you have no choice on the economic cho uh, choice. You you make votes and then. Um, uh, you have governments that do exactly the opposite that, uh, to what was in the political program. So as, as it was said, then the question is of trust. And I think there a, a little bit more of democracy would help because when you look at the, the Fit for 55 package of the commission, one of the measure is the creation of a new ETS uh, to, of, uh, to road transport and, uh, and to uh, buildings. Uh, that would have an effect on people because they would have to pay more for eating and for, uh, for transport. If you would have asked people uh, their, uh, their opinion on that, they would have said from the start that it was not a good idea. Uh, but at the end, what you see is that, yeah, that's the, politi uh, that's the political choice that is done by the commission. And that's the first uh, initiative that would have an effect on people or on companies because the other parts of the legislation will have effects not, uh, yeah, this ETS would have effect on 20, uh, 2025 or 2026 when the other uh, initiative that needs to decarbonate the economy uh, uh, focused on company would have effects in 2030, 2035. So I'm not saying that it's not, uh, we don't need to put a, a, a time for companies to change, but the narrative that it sends to people also is bad because you say, you will have to pay for the transition, even if you can't. So if you would have asked people, they would have said, I have another ID, as it was said by Hélène, they have IDs, we have to, uh, to try these IDs and not impose uh, those who will affect the most affected. Actually, really, can I just say something on yes. this? Please, Roman, come in. Just broadly, and you know, since the mention of Brexit and I live in Brexit land, um, I mean, one of the most striking things about the referendum 
uh, in the UK uh, was the lack of public debate and deliberation at the local level. It was a classic referendum that we've seen used by populist leaders throughout history, or at least in the last century. Um, it wasn't one, you know, there was uh, no, for example, that there should have at least have been a year's worth of public debate, deliberation in local assemblies, local government, all sorts of things, so that people were informed about the issues. And so I think it was uh, an example of the way that it, it, I, don't, I don't think it shows a failure of direct democracy, uh, actually. I think it, it shows a, a way that politicians manipulate whatever they want whenever they can. But the whole point of what we're talking about here is to revitalize democracy, to connect it more with people. I, and I really, I mean, it's very interesting hearing about these potential issues with citizens' assemblies, but I think I've got a lot of faith in them, partly because they're part of changing a democratic culture. So we have genuine debate. And certainly the ones that I've been involved in, what struck me is in relation to trade unions, though they haven't had organized trade union representation on them because it's individual citizens, the range of people there has been really remarkable that I've seen. For example, migrant workers whose voices are almost never heard, who aren't necessarily organized. Because I noticed in the Q&A, someone was mentioning migration. I mean, a whole load of um, semi-employed workers, women working at home or uh, part of the care economy at home who aren't necessarily organized in unions, but they're all workers in the broadest sense. And citizens' assemblies um, are giving a potential voice there. One other just point that just came to mind as I was listening to you, Ludo, was thinking about, you know, the way, you know, historically workers have tried to get representation on company boards and things like that in many, many European countries, like in Germany, um, and something that's been happening in the UK and probably other countries, like there's, a, there's an energy company in the UK called Good Energy, it's a renewable energy company, they've set up a children's board or a young people's board, um, so there's, they have a, a group of, I think, 10 or 12 young people who are there to sort of inform the main board of the company about taking more long-term intergenerational justice, ecological issues into account. Now, they don't have much power yet, um, but it's part of an interesting cultural change of saying, hey, why don't companies also represent the interests of young people? And I think there's probably a confluence between the, what the young people will want, what workers want in trying to get a just green transition. And I'm wondering, Ludo, what you think about that idea of young people being represented more in workplace democracy. For sure, uh, for sure, it's needed. Um, I think what, uh, two important uh, examples from our last Congress of the ATUC in the text that uh, we adopted in 2019 is that we, we put uh, in the text that we need to look all the policies through the sustainability first principle. And the second question was also, uh, they are more linked to youth, uh, that we have also to do generation tests to all the policies that we, are, uh, that we have. So, I'm not saying that we are perfect in this and that uh, uh, it's also a reminder for me uh, uh, that uh, we have to look at that uh, at every time. Uh, but yeah, this is clearly also uh, that uh, what can ensure that uh, that we, we, we have this forward looking uh, uh, future uh, check. Uh, and yeah, for sure in the workplace, we need also to uh, reinforce uh, uh, the youth presence. This is, uh, this, uh, this is clear. The, the main difficulty of that is, of course, that people that uh, can really uh, become representative of workers are often those who are in uh, in, uh, in long term contracts, uh, and um, and this is of course not the case of uh, of young people that are in precarious uh, situation that are working in platforms where their collective rights uh, are completely denied, uh, where uh, when they begin in the labor market, uh, yeah, the, uh, you get you got uh, uh, fixed on contract and. It, it's also a, a, a challenge that is not easy uh, only with the goodwill uh, to, uh, uh, to resolve, but for sure we need more goodwill uh, to ensure that we will uh, we'll do that. Thank you, Ludo. Um, Helena, let me, let me also say, and it fits a bit with what Ludo said, I can understand your frustration with, with the trade unions sometimes in, in this, maybe on how they actually relate to these citizens' panels. Um, but I think it's a question there of what they call in German Berührungsangst, the fear of things that you don't know. And I think that's why I find this discussion so useful, because up to now, I think in the whole, what we call sometimes the deliberate wave movement or the citizens panels movement, 
where, where I'm a lot involved in via, via Twitter. I've created a special Twitter list of all those people who are very much um, involved in, in those discussions. But we are actually talking a lot to ourselves instead of to other uh, uh, people that should know about these new ideas on how you can reimagine democracy, how can you reimagine uh, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, I think, for instance, I, I myself, I was a journalist, and I see that the media have the same problem a little bit like the trade unions when they talk about citizens' panels. You know, when I look at my ex-colleagues or traditional media, whoa, citizens' panels, you know, it's like in the beginning when we had uh, internet journalists, uh, all the media at that time said, well, internet journalists, wow, so bad. Now, of course, they're all on the internet, all these media, but that's the normal thing that you have in the beginning because you don't know each other that well. And I think therefore discussions like this that we have today are, are, are really useful. But um, let me also say something about my own country in, in, in Belgium. There are a lot of citizens panels that are already happening in the German speaking part of the country, as you probably know, uh, they have a, a kind of a institutionalized citizens involvement already. One of the main also authors um, years ago already on this new movement, David van Rijbroek, uh, is something that is very well known uh, to, to somebody loved by others hated because he wrote a book uh, called Against Elections. Now there, Helena, I want to provoke you. Are you against elections? And what do you think of the ideas of David van Rijbroek? Oh, I, I largely agree with uh, with David. So we, I know him well, and we are in agreement mostly. Uh, so yes, I I've come around to that notion that elections are fundamentally oligarchic; they distribute power unequally. So as long as we stay in that system where that's the main way we select our legislators, we are going to have the problems we have, which are lack of responsiveness to majoritarian preferences, bad governance because there are huge blind spots in the vision of those even well-intentioned you know, uh, elite groups, like evidenced in the way, you know, they totally fail to anticipate the reaction to a carbon tax and basically cause the yellow vest movements to emerge. Same thing with uh, Black Lives Matter in the US, like the entire swath of the population whose interests are not represented. So that's why it's very important for unions to do this fight from the outside to bring in the conversation the interests of these underrepresented constituencies. But at the same time, what I fear is that you know, um, unions are kind of caught up in that padding of electoral democracy themselves. That's how you choose your representatives. And your vision of, of politics is extremely adversarial. And as a result, you're caught up in this bad faith, partisan fighting and, and approach to politics. So when I hear Ludovic say, well, yes, citizens assemblies, maybe, but we need to be complementary, you know, to them. Yes, yes, sure, a complementary can mean many things. Uh, to me, at the end of the day, you need a vision of politics, of, of democracy, where um, citizens are at the center and at the top, and everything else, including group interests, including trade unions, are subordinated and in a position of support, not rivalry. So complementarity, yes, but it can't be equal power. It's got to be you know, subordination. And I'm not sure you know, unions are ready to, to give up on, on that, which is why often I heard they oppose mid movement, schemes like that, where you actually have a, uh, uh, labor represented on boards of administrators in, in German sort of, uh, you know, um, models of, of firm governance. Um, and it weakens unions because all of a sudden you don't need the fight from outside because you have the power from the inside. But why is that bad? I think it's a much more efficient way to, to get things done and, and obtain uh, worker representation. And that's why we have way fewer demonstrations and violence, frankly, uh, in countries like Germany than in France, where we don't have this mid Pestimum co-determination model. So workers and, and people who don't feel represented go and break stuff. That's not my ideal. I mean, it works better than if you didn't have the freedom to break stuff, but is that the democracy we want? I, I'm in favor of a more fluid, more open and more peaceful way of doing things actually, because you include more people from the get-go in a deliberative uh, setting, open setting. But sometimes it feels like unions just want to preserve their power, even at the cost of like changing the system from the inside. So just, I'm just trying to be provocative here, but 
No, no, it's it's it, it's good that you're uh, that you're open ab about this. Um, I think you are a bit caricaturing sometimes, and not really that much involved in in trade unions to really know that there is a lot going on. I think trade unions are learning very quickly also in terms of their own internal democracy there are still some uh, like in all organizations still some flaws and some weaknesses but ludo can maybe say something about that uh, if you want to react to to uh, to helen like it's more also a general thought it's uh, i think it's impossible for us to accept that uh, that trade unions would be subordinated, that the interest of workers in the workplace would be subordinated to the decisions in citizens' panel, because we also have to look at what is produced in the workplace. In the workplace, in companies, their workers produce wealth. Uh, there, uh, they, uh, uh, they want, uh, if we organize as unions, is uh, to be able to redistribute in a fair way this wealth. Uh, that is uh, that is produced there. So that's why, as I said at the beginning, democracy is not a disembodied subject because we have to discuss also about inequalities, about how uh, how uh, the the wealth is produced, is redistributed in society, and it means that workers that are producing this wealth have also uh, their word to say on how it is uh, redistributed, not only in terms of wages but also their working conditions. So. Why should their working conditions, which they have the right to discuss uh, with uh, their bosses, uh, why should their working conditions, their protection, their health and safety be subject to citizens panel that have no uh, clue about uh, what is happening in the workplace and also no clue about uh, what the also the authoritarian uh, management that you can face in the uh, in the workplace. So this is also uh, there that I say it's complementary because it's complementary, but it's a different role. It's different responsibilities. You can accept that you uh, that you be in alliance with different progressive forces in different fields of society, and that democracy uh, can reinforce itself by being present in every side of society and different interest groups uh, defending it. So that's what I meant also by complementarity, but different responsibilities. When we talk about political players or, or people that actually are within the, the whole circle of, of power, let's talk also about political parties. There is a question in the, uh, in the audience here from Paul Lim. Can there be a parliament where uh, not only political parties would sit, but also communities, districts, civil society organizer, uh, organizations as a way of direct democracy. I know that in the um, in the deliberative wave community, some people have thought about, okay, there should be two chambers. You know, the first chamber is people who are elected like we have now. And then second chamber, which is people who have been chosen by a sortition process or whatever, and also have a complementary role to play um, and that that's maybe something that both of you could actually say say something about sure. Helen? yes so i i think a hybrid solution like that is probably the most plausible pathway uh, in fact in france uh, the third legislative chamber which was really inefficient and still is actually and very little influential which was the, this place where uh, organized civil society is represented was a good candidate for replacement by a, a lotocratic body. And that's what Macron said initially. He said, we're, we're going to abolish that chamber, which is not very useful and costs a lot. And just, you know, anyway, there's, there's a lot of issues. And we're going to replace this with a chamber of participation where with a lotocratic body. But then that turned into something else because precisely union members and, and other members of organized society fought back to save their institutional life. And they turn this into something very weak, which is a chamber of participation, where I think we're losing you there. Control the participants and and convene them at will. But that's just to me, it's, it's that's weakening considerably the the plan. So that that's what I have in mind when you say a caricature. I have a very specific case in France of where well, that's exactly what happened, where. The, the, the resistance to new publics and participation from citizens came from, from in part union members. So just, you know, so I think a hybrid model is, is probably a good pathway. I think it's good to have, to maintain elected uh, assemblies because I don't see how we could get rid of them and they, are, they, they perform useful functions uh, of controlling government among other things. But when it comes to the legislative agenda, I think that, that should be decentered toward uh, the autocratic body. 
Roman, should the, the UK abolish its, uh, its second chamber? It has a very special second chamber now. Maybe uh, you could abolish it and replace it by uh, uh, a citizen's uh, uh, chamber, no? Absolutely. I would love the House of Lords to be abolished. <laughs> it is the most anachronistic institution in Western democratic history, as far as I can still see, pretty much so. Um, I mean, I remember when I was a student of political science 30 years ago, we used to talk about replacing the House of Lords, the upper chamber, with um, interest groups in society. You know, we will have unions and teachers and so on and all these, these different groups. And I think over time, um, my view shifted from that more to the sortition idea that we're talking about today, um, partly because I think there's so much I've seen so much energy around citizens uh, panels of various kinds in different <laughs> countries. And I think they speak to the fact that any one person has multiple identities. Of course, they are a young person or they're a second generation immigrant or they're a precariat worker or whatever they are. And, I haven't thought about this enough, so I don't have a definitive answer. But my guess is that if you did replace something like the the second, the upper chamber in the UK with um, a citizens sort of panel sortition kind of chamber, which was revolving every six months and 50 of the 300 people went out and, and so on, you would start getting the formation of natural groups of people would coalesce together as workers or as young people or as people of different religions or so on and you'd have lots of cross-cutting groups which would might be a bit more fluid than our sort of idea of interest group politics as Ludo's kind of describing it but that would, might have a kind of a dynamism and a democratic health to them that I think would probably be good and inevitably you know there would be those interests organized interests from outside society would be trying to influence the people in that chamber um, you know, whether it is big businesses or trade unions or whoever. But actually, I think the fact that people will only be there for a temporary amount of time, uh, they're not linked to political parties, all these things will encourage a kind of an independence of voice and not being caught by, you know, traditional oligarchic um, democratic interests. Can I just say, I, I, I mean, I think Roman nailed it. It's, we, we don't want a democracy of interest groups, which is what kind of, kind of what we have. It's the democracy of, of, you know, of and for individuals in the end. We are the morally relevant units, not unions, not parties. And the problem is that when you visualize or conceptualize democracy as a fight between interest groups, what happens? Lots of people fall between the, the cracks. And, uh, in, in, and in the extreme, you get the, the American situation. In the US, you have, I think, close to 78% of the people who get 6% of the lobbies in Washington, of the groups, you know, in Washington. I mean, this is insane. So. So I think there's, there's a way in which doing the, the going the autocratic path re-empowers individuals on, on, on equal grounds. And that's what's beautiful about it. And I think that's what, we, if, we, if we resist and we really want to maintain the power of like subgroup and unions, we get factions. And, and I don't think it's a good, you know, precedent. Can I say one other little thing on that, you know? I absolutely still do believe in the importance of unions, you know, for... Um, <laughs> Securing, yeah, for securing rights, for being disruptors in society, for having that long-term vision that Ludo was talking about, both in collective bargaining and the long-term struggles for workers' rights, you know, from the mid-19th century. Um, you know, I was I have to admit, I was slightly disappointed recently when I was at the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion um, protests in the UK in London, sort of on the streets, that I, I didn't feel a big trade union presence there. Though, of course, a lot of the people who were there were there were you know were parts of trade unions um and I, i'm not quite sure of what the relationship is between say the uk trade union movement and the direct action ecological movement but you know trade unions have historically been important disruptors in society and you don't get change without grassroots disruption um and and i think this is what and we need it and and unions of course are part of that in so many countries and it's really important uh for this transition to the sort of a, a, a sort of a green new deal world, let's call it. You know, what you're acting on? Yeah, uh, rapidly. Uh, I'm not saying that we need a democracy of interest group. I'm saying the economy uh, has different interests uh, and workers uh, are the, the parts uh, that try to organize themselves to be heard uh, in, the, in the economy. Uh, and this has consequence in democracy. 
uh, in how uh, then we run democracy, uh, taking into account these different uh, interests uh, in the uh, in the economy and how the economy uh, function. And I think there, uh, that's why uh, we meant uh, that uh, it has to be complementary. But then on, I don't have strong feelings on how a parliament should uh, integrate uh, different uh, different uh, groups or representative of youth, etc. Because as unions, we also see ourselves as counter power. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are participating. We want to participate in the elaboration of, uh, of, of the measures in, in the economy, but we do not want to replace uh, politics. Uh, so uh, we are actors, but we are not uh, we are not pretending that we will run uh, politics. Uh, but there, uh, one of the elements uh, of having a youth representative in a parliament or having a, yeah uh, some uh, some other groups representative in parliament, it can help. But I think it's also important to not have an idealized vision of what youth is or another type of. Uh, um, of group because uh, in the there's no youth interest in general uh, except on the question of climate that can be okay do uh, do not uh, uh, destroy our future uh, but when you are uh, young people uh, we, uh, from a rich uh, uh, from a rich family or a rich country or if you are a young people from a different uh, social status or if you are a precarious worker or if you are in the uh, already in the elite and uh, and that your parents uh, give you two, uh, two houses, I think you don't have the same interest in society. So uh, it would not be helping democracy to say that they are yeah, here also the disembodied uh, subject uh, like, like you that would have same interest uh, when it is not the case. We have social status uh, and so we have different interests. So I think it's in, that's the way democracy should also work to ensure that these different interests are taken into account. But, but there, is a, there is a question that actually links immediately to what you just said, Ludo, in, in the audience from Cecilia, who says trade unions in Germany are losing members and also most of their members are on average 46 to 48 years old. I don't know if that's a fact or if that's something that uh, she thinks. How can a union defend democracy if its members do not represent the new generations? I mean, I know that you are doing with trade unions a lot to mobilize young people. Um, does does that does all those actions do all those actions really work? And how how come that you do not attract young people, or or am I wrong? Do you attract young young new generations? We we have for sure. I we have for sure a challenge uh, in attracting uh, young people. There are a lot of efforts that are done, but as I said, it's also linked to actual situation in the labor market. So of course, it is uh, more easy to organize when you are uh, in, a, in a sector uh, where uh, the, uh, you, you are on an open-ended contract and that you can be, uh, that you are protected against being fired, uh, etc. So uh, we know that with the neoliberal wave since uh, three uh, decades, uh, flexibility and precar uh, precarity have been at the center of the different economic policies. And of course, the first victims are those who enter in the labor market. And there, there are two categories that enter in the labor market. It's the uh, young people and it's migrants. So of course, they are the most precarious in their entrance in the labor market. So it means also it's difficult to organize. It means also then that uh, institutionalized uh, uh, unions that have passed, uh, that have uh, uh, been able in the past to, uh, uh, to to mobilize and to organize a lot uh, of workers have more challenge to organize them and today there's a lot to do uh, and I'm the first one to say it uh, but we can also explain the why. Okay we, we have about 10 minutes left and um, I, I also at the end would like to make a sort of a, a conclusion in five minutes but I still have a kind of a provocative question for you Helene. Um, which is, uh, I mean, I'm a big, big lover of the citizens' panels, and I'm really an admirer of your book and, and your work. But what I miss in the book sometimes is the social dimension. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at what you write, it's quite theoretical, and it's, it's a lot of things I can agree with, but um, thinking that every citizen has the same kind of social starting point to get involved in discussions in citizens' panels, uh, I didn't find a lot on that. If I think about, for instance, 
a poor woman with living alone, having no husband, having two or three children, maybe having two different jobs to make ends meet, et cetera, et cetera. And she gets sorted out to sit in those one of those citizens' panels. Um, do you think she will come in? Actually, it, it, it fits with one of the questions I saw also in the, in the audience, the uh, questions, uh, Q&A there. Do we have any idea of people um, who didn't participate, even if they were chosen? So the, the social aspect, the social starting point of people in society are not always the same. Some of them will be able to, to, um, to participate, will have the time to participate. Others will not. And also linked to another question that I saw in the, in the Q&A is that um, should those people who are in citizens' panels, who are nominated in citizens' panels and, and participate, should they be paid? Because if they get paid, then they become like politicians. So what do you say to that? Well, a lot of questions. So I'm telling you to put back the question to you. This poor woman with children, uh, you know, uh, no resources. Uh, can be a man too. Do you think she'll have time to like run for candidates in, in an election? Do you think she'll even have like time to pay a union you know, or the resources to pay a union membership? Or, you know, I'm not saying that we, we have to compare the alternatives and, and none of them are necessarily very good. But at least with um, uh, a randomly selected body, as, as they are conceptualized in the literature currently, um, she would be given a direct access to something that really matters, where her voice would be heard, not just her vote, her voice, her story, her struggles. And, and yes, of course, theorists of, of these mini publics want people to be paid or at least compensated for their time. You're supposed to give this woman um, daycare, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, host her. And, and, and it's, it's an, actually an incredible opportunity for a lot of people to, to meet a new circle of, 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 uh, of, of people just to learn about different life experiences, to share, to be confronted to diversity, to encounter otherness, right? Which they might never do in their very narrow, you know, uh, world circles and neighborhoods. So I think that's the beginning of, of where, where, that's a way to create new solidarities a new understanding of what it is to be a, a collective, uh, a people. So I think that it has a lot of virtues. And, and I don't really um, understand, I mean, and I, I will grant that in my book there's very little about social groups and um, social movements. Uh, I suppose it's because my, mm, my concern was more like the architecture uh, of institutions and the way I see it, social movements and organizations are more like uh, the, the water that will eventually flow in that architecture and occupy it. And so it's something that I cannot legislate into being or, or, in, or, or, or think into being ahead of time. It's really hard to predict, but I just at least want to create um, a building or like um, uh, an architecture that's welcoming to uh, not only individuals, but associations of individuals, of course. So where would they fit in this model where I think you would have pretty much uh, the same groups uh, emerging and reforming under an open democracy as they are in a, in a, in a closed one. Uh, simply they, they, they would perform different functions and they would be uh, you know, interacting in different ways. I, I'm not entirely sure how, but I, I don't think that I'm ruling them out of existence um, you know, in, in the book. Does that help answer the question a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Roman, you want to come in on that or on something yeah. else? Want just, to a, just, just, just a small point here, which is that I sort of feel one of the strange, uh, interesting things about this conversation is that we're, it, it's like we're talking about citizens panels as some kind of new, strange thing, but we already have citizens panels. We use them in the judiciary. They're called juries, right? And we have a whole system for making those work. Sometimes they work better than others. We have ways of getting representative samples of people, paying people and so on. And so, you know, we've already got this model to work with that we can maybe improve on. And, you know, I certainly noticed when I've been part of and involved in citizens assemblies and talking to people who've been part of them. Yeah, there are real challenges to get people along to make sure there's diversity, um, you know, to get people to actually turn up regularly every time. But like one of them that I went on, you know, we gathered online, we discussed climate change. I've hardly ever been in such a diverse group of people in my life. You know, as I was in that online meeting of 50 people from north of England talking about 
climate change and renewable transport and, and so on. And, and yeah, they were paid a small amount to go there, but it was actually really easy for them to turn up. Um, and everyone had learning to do like I did, like they did. And we all helped each other, as it were. And um, it felt, you know, I don't want to be too utopian about this, but it felt genuinely democratic. And this is about learning, you know, learning how to be a new kind of demos, a new sort of new kinds of citizens. Um, and, and this discussion, I think, is part of that. Thank you very much, Roman. I think that, that has given me kind of a, a very good hook to kind of con conclude on. This is in, indeed a, a learning exercise. I'm sure that uh, the open democracy, or you call it deep democracy, deep democracy, uh, Roman, is, is in a way not, not perfect yet either. I think sometimes it's a bit academic, it's a bit elitist. Uh, some, 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 it's, it's, it's a discussion between people who have been thinking a lot, a lot already about democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we have a lot to, to learn if I, I say e, uh, we, uh, I include myself in, in this movement. Um, we have a lot to learn also from the trade unions um, the, the good stuff that they did, also from some of the mistakes that they made, some of the democratic failures that are there, but also some of the way they've been able to mobilize people and to bring new ideas forward and to disrupt society in, in the right way. So I think that's, that's one, one of the, the things there. The other thing is that I think trade unions indeed have also a lot to learn from this deliberate wave movement and should not be afraid of talking with them much more, learning how they work, probably also giving them some, some, some indicators on how you can organize uh, in, in a way so that you include everybody, uh, also people who have less chances in society, et cetera, et cetera. There, so um, let me uh, kind of end by giving one example where I think we could have use of the trade unions as well as this uh, citizens panels movement. We are in Belgium starting, and not only in Belgium, but also in other countries, starting a big discussion on the reform of pension systems. Now, if I look at the media and I look at the politicians, how they are dealing with this, they're all very much, uh, is this all very much is a debate in the old paradigm, you know, pensions, uh, are being discussed as if there is not a big planetary climate change issue coming. They're being discussed without young people being involved. They're being discussed really uh, uh, only amongst uh, the, 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 the pension specialists, the social uh, uh, affairs specialists. And I think that pension debate should be, in all countries, should be really opened up uh, not only to trade unions, not only to social partners, but it, it could also, I think, be in the interest of the, the trade unions and of the workers that we involve citizens and citizens who uh, are also sometimes non-citizens like migrants, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think we all could actually uh, profit from that if we took just as a good example, that pension debate and we, we discussed it more amongst more people than just the ones who actually as stakeholders are now involved in this discussion. And I would like to close with that uh, for, for now. I hope we can uh, have more discussions on this later. I think it's a very interesting topic. And of course, there is some provocation there and some, some, some uh, disappointment. I saw also some comments also where some people were criticizing the trade unions very much. Others were very much defending the, the, the trade unions against uh, Helene's uh, provocation. So um, I think that kind of discussion and debate where uh, there, are, there is some passion in, in, in the debate is, is really very interesting. And for that, I would like to thank our three speakers, our three panelists here, and also the audience. And I hope that you have enjoyed this debate and maybe we can have some, some more of this in the future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.